no, no worries there. Okay, well with that, let's get started. Um, first of all, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Matthew Heffernan. I'm a PhD candidate at McGill University. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about sort of a general introduction to Bayesian inference, as well as incorporating a modeling workflow into your procedure. Uh, this is based on some recent work of mine, um, but we're going to get into that in a little bit more detail as things go on. Let me just, yep, there we go. Uh, so the general plan for this session is there's going to be this one hour general introduction to Bayesian inference and workflow, which is what I'm starting now. And then I'm going to follow this up with a two hour hands-on session in a Jupyter notebook. Um, as always, we have a Slack channel for this session. It's the uh, July 27 Bayes overview as, as written here. Uh, I noticed that there are uh, 37 participants and uh, fewer than that in the Slack channel. So please, if you have not joined the Slack channel yet, go ahead and do that. Uh, as well, while you are sort of getting things ready, maybe if you haven't done a Git poll um, since maybe last week, it's worth doing that again. Uh, I haven't changed the material in the past few days, but let's just make sure that everybody is, is on the latest version before, before we get started with anything. So I'll leave this up for just a few more seconds for people to join the Slack channel. I see that the, the number of uh, members of that channel is going up. All right. Um, well, Slack channel's there. Uh, Thank you to everybody who just joined quickly uh, and I'll sort of get on with the big picture that we're going to be looking at. And so the big picture that we're going to be talking about really today and in the next few days is that um, let's say we have a model of some process, in our case, a physical process, uh, maybe even a relativistic heavy ion collision. And uh, we have some experimental measurements of what we believe to be the same process. And what we want to do is we want to learn about the physics that's happening by using a model. So the question is, how do we actually accomplish that? And the way that we accomplish this is through sort of systematic model to data comparison. And each of these models, for example, just here in a sample workflow, I'm giving an initial stage, hydro, particleization, and then smash. Each of those models has a parameter or sets of parameters. What we can do is by systematically comparing the outputs of the models to measurements, uh, we can constrain those parameters and, and get a sense of what they are with a quantified uncertainty. So that's, that's the overall big picture uh, that we're going to be looking at. Just to give you a sneak preview of the hands-on session, this won't come up very much uh, in the session today. Um, but heavy ion collisions are really computationally expensive and theoretically complex. And so it, it sort of muddies the waters a little bit if you're just being introduced to Bayesian inference for the first time. So what we're going to do in today's session is a one parameter, one observable problem with some familiar physics. Uh, if you've done an undergraduate physics course, you've certainly seen a simple pendulum. We're going to be extending this a little bit to include angular dependence, if you haven't seen that before. And we're going to be trying to infer the gravitational acceleration given the period, the fixed length of a pendulum, and some angular displacement. Uh, and because this is a relatively familiar physics problem, we're going to use this example to demonstrate how to approach Bayesian modeling and uh, ensure a robust and trustworthy analysis. Uh, some of the tools that we're going to use to do this are perhaps a little bit overkill for such a simple one parameter, one observable problem. But what I want to make sure to do is to give you a set of tools that you can take out of this session and basically immediately apply in your own research. So the goal here is really to uh, provide you with a set of tools in an understandable, easily digestible framework. So uh, we're going to go a little bit overkill, but hopefully some of you will find this useful. Uh, so there's gonna be a number of questions I hope to answer throughout this session. Um, so we've been comparing models with data all our lives, especially all our lives uh, sort of in, in the sciences. 
Uh, why, why are Bayesian methods suddenly becoming so big? Why, are, why do we suddenly need them? Um, and then let's say you have some additional theoretical knowledge that you'd like to include in your Bayesian study. How do you actually do that? Uh, what is a workflow and why do I need it? That's a great question. Um, we're starting to see workflows come up more and more. Um, and then how does this work in practice and where can I find more details? Both of those will be addressed in, in the hands-on session where I really tried to provide some more resources, but I also tried to sprinkle some additional resources throughout this talk as well. So hopefully by the end, uh, I, I will have clarified this for you and you, uh, you appreciate the need and motivation for all of these things. So I'm gonna start off with a simple question. What is Bayesian inference? Uh, if you're new, you haven't heard of Bayesian inference before, or maybe if you have, uh, and you've started to see this work pop up in the field, but you're not exactly sure what it does, hopefully I'm going to clarify that for you now. So what we're going to do is first start by defining two problems. Uh, in the first case, we have the forward problem. Um, and this is a generally well-defined problem. So given a set of model parameters, what are the model outputs? This is typically how we're used to running models. So you can think of it as the forward model direction. And you have uh, explicit values of your model parameters. You put them into your model, you run the model, and you get some output, hopefully observables, uh, and you compare that prediction to measurement. And so what we're really looking at here is three components. You have a model, that model has some parameters, and that model also has some outputs. Um, and, and those parameters are in all likelihood poorly constrained by first principles theory, but you, know, you can use them to fit the model predictions to measurements. So this is generally a well-defined problem. It's well posed. There's pretty much a direct mapping of set of model parameters to a set of outputs. That's the first problem that we'll define. The second problem is called the inverse problem. Um, the reason is relatively straightforward. You're running the model basically in inverse. So you're going opposite to the forward model direction. And the, this problem is generally ill-defined. So uh, what are the model parameters that result in a given set of model outputs? So in this case, you start with a set of outputs. You basically run them through your model backwards in, in big quotes, and um, you get to some model parameters. And this isn't really as well defined, especially as you go into more complex problems. For very simple problems, this may be invertible, uh, but as you get to more and more complex applications, for example, there might not be a one-to-one -one mapping of a particular output to a particular set of model parameters. Your model might have degeneracies, which means that a particular value of outputs maps to a distribution of model parameters, for example. So what the inverse problem is really doing is mapping an observable to uh, a parameter or a, a set of observables to a set of parameters or any combination thereof. Uh, and so sort of in some maybe more familiar uh, observables, if you have some region of your observable space uh, defined by two axes of observables, this hopefully will map into some region of your input space. So between your parameters. Uh, in this case, we're looking at sort of bulk viscosity and shear viscosity for an example familiar to heavy ion collisions. But there's a, there's a little bit of a problem here, uh, which is that you don't know the observables exactly. Uh, the observables are probability distributions because you have sort of some central value, you have some uncertainty around that. And so what you're really doing is you're matching an observed probability distribution to a distribution of parameters of your model. And this is what Bayes' theorem is set up to do. It allows you to infer this mapping. And so what it really is, is uh, Bayesian inference is a way to solve these probabilistic inverse problems. And this is sort of what we're interested in. So if you think of it, we have measurements. We like to know, say, what the values of, or specific values of shear viscosity are. Um, then we're trying to perform this inverse problem. So, uh, now that we know what, what Bayesian inference is, so I'm going to give you a, a short introduction to it where I'm going to define some of the things I just started to talk about. So this is Bayes' theorem. Uh, it's connecting the forward and inverse problems. I've given two completely equivalent but very slightly different formulations here. And I'm going to go through the notation of this. Uh, much of the confusion that comes in with Bayes' theorem is really uh, notational. And so I'm going to 
first sort of explain the notation. Then I'm going to go through each of these components, which I've color coded. I'm going to explain in a little bit more detail what they are. And then I'm going to give a simple example to do, uh, which uh, I'll, I'll ask you to do, but really only requires at most a four function calculator. So uh, this is Bayes' theorem. And just for the notation, uh, P of something, let's say A in this case, is the probability of or the degree of belief in A. In, in Bayesian statistics, probability represents a degree of belief uh, rather than, say, a long run limiting frequency that you might have been, been taught about in school. Um, in this notation, A and B are propositions or statements. Um, in practice, these can be uh, a hypothesis or and data, for example, uh, where a hypothesis is a particular set of model parameters, so a particular set of values. Um, so that's how that maps between these two definitions. So um, that's just that connection there. Uh, this vertical bar that you see throughout uh, these statements is conditionality. So uh, A bar B comma C means A given, and then in parentheses, B and C. So the comma means and. And then something important that sometimes is left out of formulations of Bayes' theorem is this I, which represents all the other information that you're using. So this can include your theoretical expectations that go into your prior, which is why it's here in this, in this green one. I'll go into that in more detail. Um, but it also includes things such as your model, which really means that all the things that you're extracting are conditional upon the model that you use, uh, which is sort of a reason to always use the most realistic or best model available to you because your results are going to be conditional upon, upon that to some extent. So the individual components here color-coded, uh, Oh, sorry, there's some shading on the, the dark purple that didn't come out. Uh, so that's supposed to say um, likelihood forward if you can't read that. Um, and so there's really four components to Bayes' theorem. In red here is the posterior. This is really the main object of interest in these studies. And it's really the solution to the inverse problem. So it's the probability of your hypothesis H posterior to comparison with data D. So this is our uh, final understanding. Um, what we then also have here in purple is something called the likelihood, which is essentially a forward problem, which is finding the probability of the data D given the hypothesis H. So it's inverting uh, the, the posterior a little bit. In green, there's the prior. So this is the probability of your hypothesis prior to comparison with the data. And so this is only informed by other expectations that you have. So theoretical constraints in the quantity H. I'm going to go through that again in some more detail on a later slide. Um, and finally, here in the denominator, you have something called the Bayes evidence, which is the probability of data given the model. Um, many times you'll see this equal sign uh, replaced with the proportionality and this denominator dropped. Uh, it's often treated as a normalization constant, but it's really key in model selection and averaging. So we're starting to see this a little bit more in the field. So I want to make sure I just uh, provide you with the vocabulary there to understand what that is. So each component by component. So um, the uh, hypo the posterior here is posterior to comparison with data. So if you think about Bayes' theorem as a process of learning, you go from a prior understanding, so a, an understanding prior to comparison with data, to an understanding posterior to comparison with data. So this posterior understanding is our object of interest. And as I mentioned before, the hypothesis uh, H, or say a proposition A, can be of just a particular set of parameter values. Um, so then the likelihood, again, so this shading is not working. Um, the likelihood is the, your probability of the data D given your hypothesis H. So I'm going to go into more detail here because this is really the most involved piece of Bayes' theorem to actually calculate. Um, and what it does is it says, OK, how likely is the observed data based on the model prediction with these parameters, as well as your model uncertainty, as well as your data uncertainty. Uh, now, typically in these cases, uh, we use a particular form of the likelihood called the Gaussian likelihood. And this assumes that the errors are normally distributed in both the model and the data. Uh, this may not actually be the case, and I'll talk about that briefly later on. 
So um, just to expand a little bit on the Gaussian likelihood. So this is the formulation of the Gaussian likelihood. And so you will likely just uh, recognize this as the standard uh, normal distribution. Um, you have a, a prefactor that uh, is dependent on the, the root of the variance. You have an exponential and you have this standard form where you have the data minus your model, uh, model prediction here. Uh, divided by a uh, factor times the variance. Now, this can vary very largely over, over scales. And so to make this well-conditioned numerically, we often represent it in the form of the log likelihood. Um, and so I'm just sort of giving this log likelihood form here. So you can sort of move from one of these from the top to the, to the bottom now by just taking the logarithm. Uh, and this is really the form we see it in most commonly. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a 1D example so the variance is the sum of the model variance plus the data variance. So you can think of this as the uncertainty squared is the variance. And so they just add together like this. Now, this can uh, generalize very easily to higher dimensions. Uh, we're not going to be looking at this today, but I'm just going to give this to you here so the form is familiar. Um, and Basically, what happens when you move to a multi-observable, multi-parameter input is that your specific value of your model uh, becomes a vector of your model outputs, a value of the data becomes a vector of the data, and your variance becomes a covariance matrix. And so you can get correlations and other, other more technically difficult things. Um, now, because this uh, likelihood involves model calculations, this is by far the most computationally expensive component to calculate in the, in the whole process. Uh, a variety of methods exist to help. You're going to see one of them uh, in later sessions, so tomorrow and the day after. And that's using Gaussian process emulators, which I will go to at the very end if I have time. Uh, but there are other methods as well, such as approximate Bayesian computing and a variety of other things. If, you, uh, if you're interested in that, I'm happy to sort of guide you in that direction if you want to ask something in the Slack. So now our third component is the prior. And so the prior is just the probability of your hypothesis, so your set of model parameters, prior to comparison with the data. So without comparing to, to the data you're going to compare to in this study, um, what, what do you really believe about these parameters? Uh, so this should be informed by other expectations. Uh, just for examples, um, let's say you're looking at the, the shear viscosity or the bulk viscosity. Well, uh, for uh, non-decrease of entropy, you know that the viscosity must be positive or definite. Okay, so that's one constraint. Uh, that you can put into your prior. What you also know is that, um, okay, maybe let's say there's a 99% chance that uh, your, your parameter value is going to be within a certain range. Well, okay, you can tune a distribution to give you that understanding. Uh, so that's sort of how to think about encoding things into the prior is sort of a reasonable, but uh, hopefully very unrestricted uh, set of um, prior assumptions you have from your theoretical expectations. Uh, finally, I'm just gonna talk about this briefly. Uh, this is the Bayes evidence. Uh, again, it's a normalization constant. So your uh, posterior, uh, because it's a probability, has to integrate to one. And so this denominator is what um, sort of normalizes that so it integrates to one. And a way to think about this is Let's say your model is very, very well conditioned to your data. You can describe it super well. And so your likelihood is, is large. Um, if you have a very large likelihood, you probably have a very large numerator. So to have the posterior integrate to one, you're going to need a large normalization constant. Now, conversely, let's say your model isn't super well conditioned uh, to the data you're comparing to, even at your best set of parameters, it doesn't really describe the data particularly well. And what this means is the likelihood is going to be small. So with a small numerator to make sure that integrates to one, you're going to need a small denominator. And so that is how the Bayes evidence sort of reacts to the relative likelihoods of, of two models. Um, and so you can then go on and use that for, for model selection. Okay. So now I'm going to give you a simple example. We've just seen a bunch of theory. I've just given you some uh, examples and formula and describe this to you. 
Uh, let's take a moment to do the simple example, um, and I'll ask you to just work this out quickly. A phone calculator is more than sufficient. Uh, and let's say, um, I'll give you just a few minutes once I'm done walking through this. So let's say you're in the town of Jetscapeville and 40% of all rainy days in Jetscapeville have, have cloudy mornings. Um, now, on the other hand, 30% of all mornings in Jetscapeville are cloudy. And in July, it's typically rained on five out of 31 days. Uh, now, today you woke up in Jetscapeville and the morning was cloudy. And so using Bayes' theorem, what is the probability of rain today? So up here, what I'm asking you to calculate is the probability of rain given that there were morning clouds. And just for the sake of argument, uh, I'm going to give you uh, a, a simple formation of Bayes' theorem uh, without the, the I, which we understand is implicit. And if you take a few minutes to just sort of calculate this and maybe give me a uh, green check in Zoom once you've done that, and maybe even uh, put in the chat uh, what you think the probability of rain given that there are morning clouds are. So I'll just put in the chat here. So I see two responses so far. I'm just going to wait a little bit longer for more to roll in. All right, so I'm just going to now give a little bit of a hint to anyone who might be waiting still is uh, rain is A and uh, morning clouds are, are B. Um, is there anyone who, uh, who's looking to put, put these pieces together? Okay, it looks like we're getting, we're getting an answer of about 21.5%. And so I'm just going to walk through this uh, just to, to make it completely explicit. And right, so given that identification I've just made, uh, P of uh, rain given morning clouds is P of morning clouds given rain times P rain divided by the probability of morning clouds. Um, 
And so we know from the, the left-hand side here that probability of morning clouds, given that it rains is uh, 40%. The probability of rain overall is five over 31. And the probability of morning clouds in July in Jetscapeville is 30%. Uh, so just putting that together, you get uh, 0.4 times 0.1613 all over 0.3, which gives you 0 0.2151. Um, so yeah, congratulations to everybody who got 21.5%. Uh, um, that's correct. And really that is that is just a very uh, straightforward way of performing a Bayes theorem calculation. So uh, thank you to everyone who, who checked and, uh, and replied in Slack. So now that we've done that in a simple example, I'd like to take a brief pause if there are any questions. Um, if there's any sort of unresolved things about Bayes' theorem before we move on uh, to, to other topics. So please raise your hand in Zoom or put something in Slack, but I'll wait about 30 seconds uh, before, before moving on. Oh, also, Zoom just told me that my connection is unstable. So, if it's seeing no questions, I'm going to, to move on. Um, thank you, everybody, for the participation there. So, I'm just going to ask a few questions. Uh, so, if, when is it reasonable to use Bayesian inference? Um, so, Bayesian inference is really ideally suited to the problem when uh, an accurate quantification of your uncertainty is, is a key part of your result. Um, so if you're looking for a maximum likelihood, just single point estimate, uh, you could use Bayesian inference, but it might not be uh, the, the easiest tool to implement. But if you really want to have an uncertainty quantified, uh, Bayesian inference is really well conditioned to that. Uh, another case when Bayes' theorem is really ideal is if you have theoretical expectations that add a good amount of constraint. Uh, a good amount of constraint, for example, can just be positive definite. Um, and this is a great way to just put that into your study and be explicit about what you're doing. Uh, another great case for Bayesian inference is when you've got many parameters that are constrained with many measurements. Uh, in particular, if your model doesn't contain every possible thing, you're probably going to have some tension here, which is going to add uncertainty. And so having a quantification of all of these things and covariances and whatever else uh, is something that Bayesian tools are really well set up to provide. It's also really well set up to um, provide you with comparisons between complex models. Uh, as I was talking about with the Bayes evidence, and as was recently done in a Jetscape, uh, in a series of Jetscape publications, um, you can really do uh, complex model comparison uh, with, with Bayesian inference. Another case where Bayesian inference is really well suited is when you're making broad statements about models that might not be justified by first principles theory. Uh, so if you're saying, for example, no model of a particular type can reproduce the data, well, it's important to quantify your uncertainty of that and be very confident before making such a statement. And so you could just run at a selection of points in your parameter space, or you could really do a wide ranging Bayesian study and see what you can predict based on your calibration to models. And if none of those predictions reproduce the data, for example. An advanced topic is when no single model is best suited to the data. And so there are things called Bayesian model mixing and Bayesian model averaging. And uh, again, in a recent Jetscape paper, we did some uh, Bayesian model averaging, um, but these are some advanced topics and are uh, sort of just mentioning them for anyone who's interested if you want to learn more. So a question that always comes up when proposing uh, Bayesian methods is, okay, we've been learning what are called frequentist methods in our coursework uh, for the most part. Uh, why, why is this actually a better set of tools to use? And so just some overview facts about Bayesian techniques. Um, it's really more intuitively interpreted. And when you look at a plot, it's probably already how you're interpreting a result. So when you look at a plot and you have a central value in some, some band, you're probably, uh, and let's say that's the 95% confidence interval you're probably already interpreting that as 
okay, there's a 95% chance that my result is between these two points. Rather than, for example, if I repeat this study an infinite number of times, I can expect 95% of those results to fall between the, the uncertainties. Um, and so it's really more intuitive for how scientists interpret plots and results already. It's also simpler and easier to teach turn around and immediately apply in your research, which I hope is, is what many of you take out of this. Um, We've already seen what Bayes' theorem is. What we're going to see for the rest of today and tomorrow and the day after are really tools and applications, but you've already seen the core of how to do Bayesian inference in that very simple uh, Jetscape fill rainy example. Um, and that thing is it doesn't really rely on complicated formula. Um, we've made all the explicit statements, we've given the, the form of the likelihood, and so there's not really that much more that comes into uh, making these estimations of uncertainty, as opposed to say maybe some frequentist methods, which can maybe reproduce a lot of the same Bayesian results, but getting there is a lot more complex mathematically. And then a final advantage of the Bayesian techniques are that uh, by construction, they force you to make your assumptions explicit. Uh, you're not hiding these in mathematical abstraction, you're writing them down and justifying them at every stage. And that really helps clarify what you're doing because a lot of confusion can come from assumptions that are being swept under the rug and maybe not made explicit. So this is really an advantage of the Bayesian technique as well. So I think it's also important to uh, mention what Bayesian inference is and what it isn't. Uh, and this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I want to sort of provide it here and I'll upload it for your reference. Um, Bayesian inference is a method to systematically compare your model to data, but it's not just a simple best fit answer. So what you're getting is a lot richer than that. What it also lets you do is quantify your uncertainty in a rigorous way, uh, but you're not driving your uncertainties to zero by some arbitrary technique. You really are getting a sense of how uncertain you should be about this, uh, this knowledge posterior to comparison with data. Bayesian inference is also really reliable with rigorous validation, uh, but it's not rigorous without, uh, not reliable without that. So to ensure that your results are reliable, uh, you need to rigorously validate your model and validate your tools that you're using to do this inference. Finally, uh, it is trustworthy uh, when you report your diagnostics. So again, making sure your model works, making sure your tool works. But uh, if you're not reporting those diagnostics about the tools that you're using, it's not necessarily as trustworthy because there are so many things that might just be a little bit off in such a complicated modeling environment. And we're going to see a little bit of examples of how to do these diagnostics, as well as to do uh, rigorous validation in the hands-on session. There's a final thing I'd like to emphasize that the goal should, uh, should never be just precision. Uh, the goal should be uh, accuracy and precision, but what you always want is to have some so your truth basically contained within your uncertainty. Um, and so if you're driving your precision to, or your uncertainty to zero uh, with arbitrary techniques, then you're very likely going to extract something inaccurate. And so again, your goal is to quantify the uncertainty, not to wind up with no uncertainty. Just a few notes about measurements and predictions of probability distributions is that uh, Experimental data are often averages over ensembles. So you're getting a mean value with a statistical uncertainty on this mean, uh, as well as some additional systematic uncertainties. And uh, these may be normally distributed, but they are very, very likely not. Um, now, models also have uncertainty of all of these kinds. Uh, you have a statistical uncertainty from, say, a finite number of model runs, a finite number of particle collisions or particles in your, in your system. You have a numerical uncertainty from say interpolation or you have a finite grid size, which is going to contribute. Uh, but you also have a systematic uncertainty in, in models, uh, which are approximations that you're making, maybe things that you're intentionally not including. So you do have, have all these components and those are, those may be normally distributed, they may not be normally distributed. I just want to mention that explicitly. And what we're going to be doing uh, and what is done really in practice a lot of the time is that we're going to just assume that all uncertainties are normally distributed. Um, this is 
basically just an agnostic statement. Uh, many of you, especially experimentalists, are probably saying systematics should not be assumed to be normally distributed. Um, but really, without any more information, uh, this is basically the best one can do. Um, there might be some other techniques, but this is sort of just the, what's fairly standard. Uh, but this also really provides an opportunity for theorists and experimentalists to come together and explore these systematic uncertainties, maybe report full covariance matrices, and then incorporate these into Bayesian studies in ways that, um, that really make this more consistent. And this, will, this kind of collaboration will really help uh, constrain things in both an accurate and precise way. So the last thing I'm going to talk about uh, really before moving on to the workflow is there's this tool that we use a lot. Uh, this is not necessarily a Bayesian tool, but is used a lot in Bayesian inference. And it is why Bayesian inference has really taken off uh, in recent years. And that, that, technique, that tool is called Markov Chain Monte Carlo, uh, MCMC for short. And what this really is, is it's a forgetful walk through a parameter space. So in most cases, uh, there's a very narrow class where this isn't true, but models take in specific parameter values. You don't pass a distribution to your model. So if you have a prior distribution, how do you connect that to specific parameter values? Uh, well, the answer is again, Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, and so in Markov chain Monte Carlo, Carlo, what you have is you have walkers that, that literally step through the parameter space. And that's what you're seeing here. These uh, black squares are the starting points. And the, the lines that you see are um, the, the path that they're taking through parameter space. So these are little, little tiny uh, folks just taking a, a, a forgetful walk. And the probability of accepting the next step is uh, sort of the, defined by the ratio of the probability of the next location versus the probability of the current location of, of the walker taking its steps. Um, I won't get too much into the details of Markov chain Monte Carlo, but I will provide some, some additional material if you're curious. So after enough steps, uh, these little walkers who don't have great memories uh, forget where they started. And once they've forgotten where they've started, uh, they start walking randomly, but not, not just randomly, but their steps correspond to samples drawn from the distribution of interest of your Markov chain Monte Carlo. This is called your target distribution. And so then once they've started walking according to your target distribution, uh, this distribution of samples can be used to estimate properties of your underlying target distribution. So that's what we're really seeing here in, in this plot from uh, Andrew Gellman's uh, Bayesian Data Analysis book, um, which is available for free online. I linked to it in the hands-on session. We have these starting positions in squares. Your walkers are taking, in this case, a directed walk. You can see they're sort of walking towards the center region. Then after a large number of steps, the walkers are basically just lost and they're, they're tripping over themselves here in this, in this region you're interested in. And then the individual samples are shown here where you've not connected the paths. And so those, the distribution of those samples can then be uh, considered samples drawn from the distribution you're actually interested in. Uh, okay, I see a question. How is, is an MCMC different from the Metropolis algorithm? Um, Metropolis Hastings is one uh, very common use uh, or algorithm for Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, there are a number of different uh, algorithms that you can use um, in what we actually call here this p of next location over p of the current location that ratio is actually called the metropolis ratio um, and i'm not actually going to use the metropolis hastings uh, algorithm in the hands-on session uh, i'm going to actually provide you with the tool that uh, for example jetscape used in our, our, our re the recent uh, sims group bayesian analysis um, and so hopefully, hopefully that answers that question. Um, just for some more detailed introduction, if you're really curious about the details of MCMC and this, um, I, I do put some uh, details of Metropolis Hastings there. Um, I just provide this link to, uh, to a GitHub, uh, which is a Jupyter notebook, just for some more details if you're curious. Uh, so what you do is again, one, start off and explore the space, two, forget the starting location, and then walk according to the target. 
So these different algorithms for Markov chain Monte Carlo are different ways of taking steps, essentially. So we have uh, just a slightly different way of doing it. So think of it as maybe race walking instead of just taking simple steps through your, your parameter space. So with that, I'm going to break again for questions. Uh, I've just thrown uh, a decent number of details at you. So if there are any questions, this is a, this is a great opportunity. All right, so um, seeing no questions, please feel free to ask these at any point as well. Uh, raise a hand, uh, put it in the Slack. Uh, if you have a question, I'm sure somebody else has a question or even the same question as well. So with that, just going to move on to uh, a Bayesian modeling workflow and why you need one. Um, so I've just thrown that term at you, Bayesian modeling workflow. What actually is that? Uh, and so what a workflow is in general is it's a repeatable pattern of steps to complete a task. Uh, you can think of it as basically similar to sort of a algorithm or formula, but it's not quite as um, formulaic, basically. Uh, this isn't a, a cookbook cookie cutter technique. Uh, this has to be sort of modified and adapted to whatever uh, task you have at hand. Um, but this is a general framework in which you can embed your modeling. So basically what this modeling workflow does is it ensures that you've taken a rigorous and repeatable set of steps for uh, a reliable development and analysis. Um, and so what this helps you do is both uh, do reliable modeling with a lot of critical self-evaluation, but it also ensures that your, uh, your analysis has been done in a very careful and critical way. And so when you have a really complex modeling environment, say uh, you know, multi-model process and heavy ion collisions, uh, you're doing thousands of runs to calculate observables, and then you're moving on to say a 15 parameter MCMC. Uh, what a workflow really helps do is it breaks it up into digestible chunks and helps you bulletproof the analysis by making sure that at every step there's been an evaluation and rigorous checking. Uh, and many of the things you're about to see are going to look very familiar uh, if you've been reading Bayesian uh, papers in the field but you might not have seen it formulated into this exact sort of workflow before. After all, our goal is really trustworthy inference. And so anything that we can do to help uh, encourage and um, ensure trustworthy inference is probably, is probably for the best. So I, I encourage you uh, in all of your modeling to sort of try to follow uh, a modeling workflow. So I'm going to go through the steps of a Bayesian modeling workflow now. Uh, I'll go through it step by step with a brief overview, and then I'll go through it with uh, sort of sneak previews of the, of the hands-on session coming up. So uh, just stay tuned. And um, if you're looking for more references, uh, this is broadly built out of Andrew Gelman's um, Bayesian modeling workflow. So your first step in a Bayesian modeling workflow, it sounds almost trivial, but it's choose an initial model. Uh, and what you want to do here is to explicitly define your model and the prior state of knowledge. Depending on what you may be doing, this model might already exist no, or no model might exist. Uh, maybe in some cases, there's a lot of different models to choose from. And what you need to do is to explicitly motivate that particular choice uh, and to explain why it's the best uh, choice for your application. The second step in a Bayesian modeling workflow, uh, we're going to call prior predictive checks. And what this does is you're going to evaluate your model and your prior together. So you're going to take samples from your prior and run them through your model, and then evaluate if the output of that is really consistent with domain knowledge. So does it look right? Um, are, and are things consistent? So if you start to see features that maybe are unrealistic or uh, just completely outside the realm of possibility and are not what, you've, uh, what you should expect at all, then what this does is it lets you go back and maybe improve or modify your initial model or prior. 
Step three is model validation via fake data simulation. So what you can do now is you can generate some fake data with your model and then do your full inference, but with your fake data and evaluate if the model in the prior can recover your known inputs. Uh, what this can also do is give you a sense of how much constraint you can reasonably expect from your observable or observables. And so what you can then evaluate is uh, if the parameter you're varying can be constrained even in a best case scenario where you know that everything in the data can be explained by your model. And then the second goal of this uh, model validation via fake data simulation is to inspect your tools to ensure that your output is reliable. So what you can do is then uh, go through and ensure that everything really does make sense, it fits together and it's working properly. Once you've done steps one to the three and you're, you're decently satisfied, you can move on to fitting the model. And what you can then do is extract the state of knowledge posterior to comparison with data. Remember, this is the goal of the Bayesian study. And then as a safety check, again, it's always important to inspect the tools using available diagnostics, which uh, we'll, we'll see an example of in the hands-on session. Then your final step five is to do a posterior predictive check, which is to take your posterior and then run samples from that through your model and see if those predictions are consistent both with the data that you've compared to and to domain knowledge itself. Um, and so are your predictions reasonable? Do the predictions predict things that you expect? Um, and you can evaluate this uh, more critically. So I'm gonna go through this uh, step by step. So step one, choose initial model. What you do is you uh, either develop a model or motivate your choice. Um, and you can then define principled priors motivated by uh, your knowledge of the model and the system. And so what you do is you can justify specific choices and why those are reasonable. So as a, as a brief example, as a sneak preview, uh, what we're going to do in the hands-on session is for the model, um, this is just a calculation of the period, we're going to use the exact formula uh, if you're evaluating the equations of motion in the absence of non-conservative forces. So in this, we'll fix the length with some uncertainty. We have uh, the initial angular displacement theta zero, um, and we can then infer uh, G, the gravitational acceleration from measurements of the period. Um, and just a very uh, initial prior, what we do is, um, let's say G on earth is going to be 99% likely to be between G on the moon and G on Jupiter fairly not, not constrained. And then I tune a inverse gamma distribution to, to match that constraint. Okay, I see a question. The question is, do we need to discretize continuous parameters for the MCMC algorithm? If yes, how do we choose the step size? Uh, also, do we need to normalize the parameter range for all parameters? So a goal of your uh, MCMC algorithm is by passing uh, your MCMC um, your prior uh, as a sort of a continuous PDF, for example, and we're going to see this in, in, a, in a moment in the hands-on session, is that the MCMC walkers will walk and they will take uh, discrete samples from your continuous distribution. Um, if you're using, say, a Metropolis-Hastings algorithm or one where you might need to manually set the step size, um, uh, that is a parameter and you can tune that to uh, sort of best practice guidelines on those diagnostics. Uh, you also don't need to normalize the parameter range. Um, I also see the question, what is gamma? Uh, I think that's sort of inverse gamma PDF. Uh, an inverse gamma distribution is a statistical distribution. Um, so similar to like a normal distribution. And uh, I'll go through why we choose this particular distribution in the hands-on session. So this is just a, a brief preview. So um, step two is prior predictive checks. And so the real process here is you uh, say, you take samples from your prior for G and you run them through your model and you get predictions for the period. And what you see here, for example, uh, we'll see in the hands-on session is that you get good coverage for a reasonable range uh, for both periods and G. So you have reasonable belief that your, your period is most likely going to be between say, about one and a half seconds and four and a half seconds, but there's a, a finite probability that's going to be outside that and you don't rule that out. It also behaves broadly how you expect 
as your gravitational acceleration goes to zero, uh, your period of the pendulum becomes undefined. So that, that broadly is tracking. Uh, if you find that your predictions are not consistent with uh, your domain knowledge, what you can do then is identify specific contradictions and rectify those and improve your model before uh, proceeding any further. So step three is model validation via fake data simulation. And this is often a very involved step. Um, but what you do essentially is that, uh, so first, actually these are called uh, alternately closure tests or empirical coverage tests. So if you've heard of those terms that it's all referring to the exact same procedure. And what you do is you say, okay, let me generate some fake data with my model. So this produces idealized data. There are no unaccounted for um, features. I then put in the, uh, so I, I put in a, a value for the truth. Using all the tools at my disposal, can I then recover that same value? Um, and so then you can also look at diagnostics, for example, um, and whatever else we're going to look at that more later. But let's say you uh, produce this plot, which we are uh, all going to produce in the hands-on session, hopefully. And what you can see is that the truth is this green vertical line and our uh, exact model samples uh, taking, we histogram this and they're distributed around it. And we do in fact recover the truth at the 50 percentile uh, vertical dashed line. Uh, so what you can then do is, uh, okay, that, that's looking pretty good, but let's make some posterior predictive distributions here and see if they are consistent with the data. So what we've done is we've just taken these samples that we've histogrammed and we plot the distribution of those samples. And we see that those are distributed basically normally uh, around the pseudo data that we've generated for this model validation stage. So what we're seeing is that yes, not only does our uh, model recover the truth value that we get out, but it's distributed in a way that is consistent with the uncertainty on the data. So um, we're basically, this is going very well. Um, and I, in this case, for just some fun and for the fun in the hands-on session, I generated the fake data with uh, gravitational acceleration on Mars, um, because also probably between um, the acceleration on the moon and on Jupiter, but you can really just sort of choose any set of reasonable values because you don't know a priori what you're going to be extracting. And yeah, we're pretty happy. It recovers the result, and so it's all going well. Okay, now that we've uh, gone through and been careful about that, we can go ahead and compare with our data, which I, I'll provide in the hands-on session. And what we do is we ask the question again, um, does the model in the prior clearly recover value consistent with domain knowledge? And so, We've got a period of a, a single pendulum in, sec uh, in seconds. We have initial angular displacement of theta zero in radians. And we see this is the data that we're going to be using. And when we perform the uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo and bin the samples, we see that what value of G we're extracting here is 9.8223. Um, and okay, so that's a little bit off from the 9.81 we expect, but we take a look at this diagnostic called autocorrelation, which I will explain uh, later, but it drops rapidly to zero. Um, dropping rapidly to zero is what we're interested in, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, but what this tells us is that the diagnostics are trustworthy, which means that our inferences worked uh, as we expect. So now we can move on to step five and then see if we can identify anything systematic. So step five is posterior predictive checks. And we take draws from our posterior, run them through our model, and uh, plot that distribution. And what we see here is that outcome, uh, just similar to the plot we used for the model validation. And you see that uh, these distributions are pretty close, uh, actually, to the uh, information here, or the data here, sorry. Uh, there's a little bit of deviation through it, um, but it seems to be broadly distributed on either side of our prediction. So for all we know, this could be a, a semi-random fluctuation, or we could be not accounting for an additional process. Um, but it doesn't look like there's anything too glaring missing. So we can probably uh, go back and investigate our model and improve it a little bit and repeat this whole process. But in general, uh, we can probably uh, accept this computation. 
Uh, just for some fun, what I'm doing here is uh, on the bottom is uh, plotting my posterior versus samples from my prior on uh, sort of this log scale. And what you can see here is that the posterior is by far and away constrained by the data. So we've got a lot of constraint when we've gone from this broad posterior in blue to this very narrow sharp posterior in orange. Uh, and that's, that's a really good sign that we're not biasing our prediction by our prior. So now, uh, are there any questions? I've seen a little bit of movement on, on Slack, but I'll also pause here um, to uh, take any questions. Okay, I'm going to move on a little bit more quickly because I see that we're uh, starting to run a bit low on time. I want to get to a little bit more material before the hands-on session. Let me just click there. So I want to give a, a brief note on priors. Um, now, if you recall what I was just showing on that bottom plot that the posterior was very um, sharply constrained by the data and we're getting a lot of constraint, uh, you might have also seen some priors um, sort of out in the wild called uh, non-informative or weakly informative priors. And what's really worth emphasizing here is that these are not general statements. Uh, you can only understand how informative a prior is uh, in comparison with the likelihood uh, or, for example, the posterior. And so the uh, a prior is weakly informative when most of your constraint is from the likelihood. So most of that constraint on the, the posterior comes from the data. If your likelihood gives you relatively little constraint, even a, say, agnostically determined uh, maximum entropy prior, if you're familiar with that terminology, can be informative on your posterior. So just a little bit more on that is, uh, what about sort of uniform priors? Uh, if I just say I have no preference between these two ranges, isn't that the most agnostic and uninformative? Well, the answer is um, a little bit more complicated than that. So depending on what your, your parameters are, this could be parametrization dependent. Uh, this might not actually be weakly informative when you transform it or say re-parameterize uh, uh, these, these parameters and, and these priors. So that can be a little bit misleading. But in general, you should really use a uniform prior when their features fit your application at hand. So if it's a faithful description of your prior knowledge, then that's by all means use a uniform prior. Uh, but if it's a little bit unrealistic, then it's maybe worth uh, sort of critically evaluating that choice. For example, a sharp cutoff in practice could be unrealistic. So a realistic example of a sharp cutoff is a proportion. So you have something that's a ratio, and so you know that's constrained, it's between zero and, it's, and, and one, and you have no preference between zero and one. So a uniform prior there, all, all well and good. Uh, but if you have, say, a continuous parameter like gravitational acceleration, and you say it's completely uh, uniform between you know, eight meters per second squared and 10 meters per second squared, and it is infinitely unlikely at 10.0001 meters per second squared, that's not really a faithful description of your prior knowledge. So basically what um, I'm suggesting is that your motivations for your prior should be fit to your application at hand. The other thing there is to accurately communicate the constraint that you have, um, especially if you're calling something weakly informative or non-informative. Uh, and there's a variety of ways you can do this. Here's just some brief recommendations is you can plot your prior and your posterior together. Um, for example, you use, use the uh, prior as a gray background and, uh, and your posterior as a colored background. Um, you can put them in your marginal distributions. So when you're just looking at single parameters, um, you can also calculate the information gained. And um, all these I'll, I'll go into in a little bit more detail in the hands-on session, so, so don't worry about that. But the really most important thing uh, throughout is to be careful, clear, and precise about exactly what you're doing. And I just want to highlight a recent Jetscape result. Um, and there's no need to worry about what this is in particular. It's the extracted shear viscosity. But what I wanted to just demonstrate is that, OK, there's the, the prior has been plotted. The posterior has been plotted along with it. And you have the prior to posterior information gain quantified by this quantity, which, again, you don't need to worry about for now. But what you can see very clearly from this plot 
is that the, uh, there's not much constraint from the, from the data at high temperatures. As you move down to lower temperatures, you get much, much more constraint from your data. And so what that can tell you is that, okay, this is where we have constraint. And up here, perhaps uh, you're being informed in part by your priors. And so this is, uh, this is where you expect it to be uh, more constrained by the data. And so there, your prior is less informative. For a little bit more guidance on priors, I'm just giving this additional resource here on the bottom. Uh, this is from a sort of a, a well-respected uh, computational uh, collaboration uh, and some developers. And uh, there's further references in there that uh, are going to be really useful uh, for anyone looking for different choices of prior. So I'm just going to move on quickly to a summary. So just a brief summary of the Bayesian inference is that you, you start with two problems. You have a forward problem, which is straightforward, uh, calculate model outputs given a, a set of parameter inputs. You also have the inverse problem, which is you're trying to find the parameters that produce a particular set of model outputs. And that can be a lot more challenging. Bayesian inference is really a tool for solving inverse problems. Uh, what you can do with it is systematically compare your experimental measurements to your calculations and then quantify your uncertainties while incorporating other domain knowledge in a clear and explicit way. Can handle a whole host of things. I'll, I'll leave this list up uh, for your own time, but it is very robust. Uh, with the use of Markov train Monte Carlo, you're uh, sort of not constrained by some other uh, assumptions. You're doing sort of non parametric sampling of your space, and you can handle a whole host of things that uh, get into some really rich physics. And what it does, it really gives you constraints with quantified uncertainty. And I can't stress enough that it should be a goal to quantify the uncertainty in, your, in, in a study, uh, because that's a representation of the accurate state of knowledge about that parameter or that quantity. And so uh, inaccurate arbitrary precision, which doesn't faithfully represent the true uncertainty, is, is not a goal of, of a Bayesian study. I just really want to make sure that's, that, that's clear and explicit. Um, and then sort of a brief summary of the Bayesian workflow. It's an algorithm to ensure reliable, robust, and reproducible inference. And that should be uh, sort of our universal goal. It's not necessarily a textbook cookie cutter set of steps that need to be adapted to particular applications at hand. But without a workflow, there's a lot of opportunities to things, uh, for things to fall through the cracks. So what a workflow does and operating within a workflow uh, allows you to get ahead of uh, things falling through the cracks and be critical and cautious and really evaluate as you take each step through this process uh, to ensure that what you're doing is um, very clearly motivated and the outcomes are well justified. So workflows result in well, mo mo well motivated, self-contained and reproducible studies. As you've seen, it gives you a clear set of steps and a clear set of checkpoints for maybe improving your model or the tools you have. Uh, it'll also give you experience with modeling that builds toward results in a really sort of step-by-step -step clear way. Uh, throughout uh, a workflow, you have the opportunity to demonstrate your familiar familiarity and mastery with tools. And it gives you a lot of intermediary results that can catch problems long before the end, it can convince your audience that you're right, and it can show them sort of uh, how the sausage is made to really prove that you're right and you've been careful. That's always good. And uh, what I'd like to have everyone be um, comfortable with after the session is to know when to use Bayesian parameter estimation, how to construct reasonable priors, how to produce these predictive distributions, both prior and posterior, how to validate models and determine if your observables um, are sensitive to the variation of your model parameters, how to use a common MCMC package that is used in production publications and production studies. I'm going to show you just an easy MCMC diagnostic. Um, and sort of how to decide it's time to compare to the real data and how to interpret these posterior predictive distributions for improving your modeling uh, and your own studies. So i um, just like to thank uh, everybody in my funding agencies, uh, primarily uh, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada and McGill, uh, as well as Jetscape for funding uh, and uh, support over the years. Special thanks to the Jetscape collaboration in general and the simulations and distributed computing working group for just constant help and uh, discussions and, uh, and really a lively discussion. 
Um, special thanks to uh, Jean-Francois Paquette, uh, Derek Everett, Weiyao, and Dan uh, for the materials, discussion, feedback, support in the chat. Uh, I just put on the bottom here my, uh, my Twitter handle if you'd like to get in, in contact otherwise, or if you'd like to ask more questions or see uh, sort of more uh, sort of production information on Bayesian work and how it applies to physics. Uh, and I'd like to break here for questions before briefly continuing um, to a quick overview of something we're going to see uh, in the sessions tomorrow and the following day. So if there are any questions, please, please go ahead and ask. There's a raised hand, Matt. Oh, okay. Um, yes, uh, Tsuan? Uh, yeah, thank you. So you mentioned that it's usually straightforward mathematically to uh, calculate answer from Bayesian instead of frequencies. And I'm wondering, are there any specific cases where uh, getting results mathematically straightforward in frequentist method, but comparison in the Bayesian approach? That's an interesting question. Um, I think we're uh, it's probably talking about edge cases just to give you the uh, a, uh, a clear reply there. So you're not going to in um, in in most cases you're not going to find really a uh, a difference uh, like that. Um, I suppose it also depends in some ways on what you're calculating. Um, I'm not aware of every possible edge case in statistics, uh, but I'll say as a general statement, uh, the tools for Bayesian studies and uh, performing sort of these uh, calculations and, and, and find the quantities that we're interested in, uh, particularly in physics, is uh, just a lot more straightforward uh, mathematically. Uh, in, in Bayesian applications than it is in frequentist. Um, so I, I won't rule out the possibility, but I'll say that uh, for mo in most, in the overall majority of cases, no, Bayesian is, is, is more straightforward. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I'm a little bit over time, so I'm going to try to blitz through uh, a little bit of material. I'm going to have these slides up and I'll have some more resources on this, but we're not going to see this in today's session. I just want to give you a, a brief overview so you know what's coming for you. Um, so uh, just going to talk about a practical aspect, which is emulators, and uh, particularly thanks to Jean-François Paquette uh, for some of these materials. Uh, so uh, a big question is, what if your model is slow? Um, Markov chain Monte Carlo can be, uh, it takes a lot of steps basically. And if, it, if you're calculating your model at every step and your model takes you know, a day to run, uh, let alone say a heavy ion collision model where doing a lot of it might take much, much longer, um, then that's not really feasible. You can't sit there for 10,000 days. Um, and so what if your model is slow? Well, um, I'm just going to put this formulation here, just some brief details. Let's say y is your model output and p is the input parameters for it. Um, and so for multi-observable model, you can think of this as a vector containing all of your observables, just sort of like that uh, multi-parameter case, uh, multi-dimension case I showed many slides back. So what you should expect in general is that your model has a relatively smooth dependence on the parameters, but you might not be able to uh, sort of know that relatively smooth dependence ahead of time. So what you can do is you can use emulators basically uh, to uh, as model surrogates and uh, run those instead of your model uh, and sort of get that out. So remember we already viewed the prediction of the model as a probability distribution with some theoretical uncertainty. And so what we want to do is mimic that probability distribution of outputs. So uh, I'm just showing a quick plot here from, uh, that are generated from a particular type of emulator called Gaussian process emulators. 
And what emulators are, are probability distributions that mimic the model outputs dependence on the parameters. Um, and so say you're unconstrained by data, they're just sort of these random functions that are drawn from your emulator. But when you uh, constrain it with data points uh, that I'm showing in black here, you're, you're, you sort of quantify this uncertainty between the points. So you constrain your model at design points. And then what you do is you estimate the interpolation uncertainty. So that's extremely important because you are in fact uncertain about how good that interpolation is. So if you don't quantify that, you're presenting an overly confident case. And remember our goal is to quantify our uncertainty in a, in a reasonable way. So uh, just a brief comment, Gaussian process emulators are just one example. There are other emulators out there um, and you have these design points that are used to then constrain the parameters of this emulator. Um, so that's just a, a little brief word about that. So here's some uh, additional information that um, your emulator is uh, over a range of parameters and you can sample that parameter space. The next thing is that these emulators do not emulate each stage of the model themselves. So you don't have, for example, uh, an emulator that's emulating step-by-step -step through, uh, say, Trento, free streaming, music, IS, 3D, and Smash. Uh, there's not an emulator sort of doing hydro. Um, what it's doing is it's just mapping um, the observables, sorry, the input parameters to the uh, outputs, so uh, model parameters to observables. Uh, practically, uh, I won't get into this too much, uh, it's not actually even the, the observables themselves. What we do is we typically use a dimensionality reduction technique called principal component analysis, and we emulate the dependence of the principal components on the model parameters, and then sort of transform back to compare. Um, a little bit more information, uh, if you're curious, uh, I'll provide a little bit of information in the hands-on session, but there's some excellent material from previous Jetscape schools. I'd just like to highlight two in particular. There's Jake Coleman's at the 2018 Jetscape school, as well as Wei Yao's uh, at the 2019 Jetscape school. Uh, and so here are just some hands-on materials if you want to look at these in a little bit more depth. So with that, that's the end of my slides. Um, are there any uh, questions now? Okay, I appreciate that this has been a, uh, a long session. And so how about what I'll do is we take, actually, let me ask the chairs, um, how long a break do you think we should, we should take before moving on to the hands-on session? Uh, it really depends on you. Um, so maybe like a five minute break, if that sounds good. Yeah, let's take a five minute break. Um, and when we get back, we'll get started with the hands-on session. Sounds good. So we'll, uh, we'll meet again at uh, 1027 Eastern. Uh, in the meantime, feel free to ask questions or whatever else. I'll, I'll be here. <laughs>